All right, so welcome to everybody. We have a nice group here, and this is our first uh, webinar, so I hope we're not too glitchy here. Uh, the way we're working it is I'm going to give you a PowerPoint presentation, and then there have been about 40 questions submitted in advance, and so I will will do my best to get through those questions. If for some reason there are just a lot uh, that I can't get to, what I would do then is uh, maybe do a second webinar just to answer questions, or, or we can repeat this. So uh, without further ado, let me share my screen with you. And I want to just, uh, let's go to the top here and do my, sorry, I've got some stuff in the way here. Here we go. All right, so just to try to cover as quickly as I can the, the basic idea, we are, I'm assuming, a community of people who uh, all experience this terrible disorder, not me, but I mean those of you who have tuned in, and it's a really awful problem, as uh, those of you with this problem know, and uh, so I want to just uh, run through the, the big picture um, and this is a laryngopedia webinar. It's about RCPD retrograde cricopharyngeus dysfunction and um, a disorder of the upper esophageal sphincter. Just so you know where we're speaking to you from, here is Chicago. We are 20 miles west of Chicago. We're in the very center of the metro area of Chicago, which goes well beyond us to the west, north, and south. This is our building, and we're in this section here with the big heavy white line. Here's a picture of our waiting room. Our staff includes not just myself, but also uh, Dr. Richardson, and Dr. Richardson happens to have just done patient number 1,000 in our group. I think we're up to, to 1,015, but he uh, had the 1,000th patient. And then Dr. Hosley here was my fellow three years ago, and so she's been involved a lot from the very beginning. And uh, so uh, all of us have had a great deal of, of experience. Melissa Wingo is our data manager, and she does a lot of our follow-up uh, telemedicines or emails or voicemails. And then our practice manager, the fellow with whom you do a lot of arranging is Kyle Bell, and Jonathan Mary is our IT and web uh, and person, so he's helping us tonight. I do need to mention that we are using Botox in an off-label use. Uh, doctors are allowed to do off-label use of medications that are uh, cleared, so there's absolutely no problem with it, but you just need to know it is off-label. It is not experimental use, it's off-label, big distinction. Our objectives, I'll just say a, a bit about the beginning of the understanding of this disorder, what the syndrome is, it's a syndromic disorder, the workup, uh, the treatment, results, and then the question and answer at the end. Uh, so if you need additional resources, Laryngopedia is my personal teaching website. It's a public service uh, kind of a website. There are, I think, a couple thousand photos here. But on here, there is this uh, post that we just call Can't Burp Comprehensive Resources. If you type that, just RCPD, into the search window, you will find this. And you have to scroll down on this page. And you will find uh, my articles. There are four of them, I think, that are all listed. And they are all open source by design. They're peer reviewed but they're open source so that you don't have to subscribe to the journal to make it as widely available as possible. There's uh, links to my YouTube videos and, and so forth. The index case was a young man from a state far away from Illinois, and uh, he emailed me through Laryngopedia. I get emails from all around the world, and when I can and when it's coherent, I try to answer. Uh, and so he sent an email describing his no burp uh, situation before it was codified or treated. I'd never encountered it or treated it. And so I thought about his problem and I wrote him, you know, I read quickly and I sort of wrote back to him and said, you need to get someone to inject Botox into your upper esophageal sphincter. 
my thought then was that this was for diagnosis, not as a treatment, but just as a diagnostic test. He told me he had had numerous tests and, and treatments, medications, and that nothing had helped. So I said, well, Botox for diagnosis. He replied, I'm coming to BVI. I said to him, you don't need to come to BVI. There are lots of doctors where you are. But he insisted because he had been through the medical mill and was a little medically jaded by all of the, he had done his part. He had seen many doctors. He had done lots of tests and he got nowhere. He said, you're the first person to tell me what might be wrong and I'm coming to Chicago. So I said, okay. Well, he got permanent relief from a single injection, and he's the one who, who started the ball rolling. I think he has been public with his name. I didn't want to include it here because, uh, you know, I should let him do that. But he went to Reddit, and subsequently the subject has hit YouTube, Facebook. The articles have come out, and uh, we're over a thousand cases now. So that this index case is typical about 10, 1,015 patients treated. And the story that they tell with some minor variations is almost the very same. Previous diagnosis at any of the 1,000? No, nobody yet. We have not yet seen one person who came to us saying, I have RCPD from a physician. They have all been sort of self-diagnosed from Reddit and, and message boards and so forth. Well, uh, in our over a thousand patients treated through net today, what has the workup elsewhere been? Well, early in the series, it was much more extensive than it is more recently, because once people saw the syndrome, they tend to just identify and they say, I want to go straight to go. I don't want to do all of that stuff that earlier people did. Barium swallows, EGD or a esophagoscopy, that's an upper scope, pH probe, manometry, which is a pressure study. You put a catheter through the nose and down into the stomach, the lower esophagus, the mid esophagus, the upper esophagus, and you look at pressure waves, cultures, biopsies, uh, gastric emptying tests. Uh, boy, I, I could make a very long list that people had been through and not one of them had gotten the diagnosis. It's an orphan disorder. So uh, what diagnosis were they given? Because surely the doctor said something about what was wrong. Well, GERD. And of course, a lot of people do have GERD who have RCPD for obvious reasons that I'll explain. Irritable bowel has been a common uh, uh, diagnosis, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, gluten intolerance, stress, and malingering. Not a few have been told this is in your head or you're just trying to get out of school or, or whatever. Um, and nobody, you know, people could have had GERD and been treated for it, but it didn't really resolve the main issues. Uh, surgical procedures have been done. I mean, it's just unbelievable the amount of work that people have gone through. Well, what about the accuracy of self-diagnosis? Once you explain the syndrome, how accurately do people self-diagnose uh, from these different sites? And the answer is, have patients self-presenting with their own diagnosis of RCPD been wrong? And the answer is no. And I have an asterisk because I did have one man from uh, a nearby state who uh, just wasn't paying attention. He, he came in with actually quite a different set of symptoms, but he just somehow latched onto RCPD. And I had a young woman who developed problems. It was acquired. It wasn't really lifelong. And uh, so I said to her, I do not think you really match. But with those two exceptions, every single person. And that's why we, we schedule people for, like I saw four people today, and I will be taking doing their uh, procedures tomorrow morning. And you wouldn't have people come from, you know, several states away or even other countries if, if uh, the diagnosis was not so securely made by self match with the syndrome. Well, have other doctors once introduced to RCPD been able to validate these results? And the answer is yes. The very first physician I explained this to was Dr. Karagama in England, and he's got a series that he's published of 100, and I bet he's to two or 300 by now. 
And so uh, that's true of doctors in New York, Boston, uh, Belgium, Germany, uh, I forget, uh, Australia, all over the place. Uh, I've uh, personally spoken to or emailed or whatever, and they have all had similar ex uh, results from me. So I think the syndromic diagnosis is very powerful. What are the cardinal symptoms? Uh, I put them as four. Number one is I can't burp and it's an issue. I think maybe a time or two in my life, I've had a circumstance where I swallowed wrong or something and I couldn't burp right when I wanted to, but it was a fluke thing. And these people say, I can't burp and it's an issue. And it's typically with few exceptions, it's lifelong. Now, they may say, when you ask them, when did this start? They may say when I was nine or when I was 21 or when I went to college. But if you then ask them, well, could you burp before it became an issue? They'll say, no, I I'm, I mean, they may do rare spontaneous burps that they can't harness and that don't really solve their discomfort. Uh, but some say I never, ever have burped or I burped four times in my life. And I can tell you where I was and what I was what I was doing each time. So can't burp basically lifelong. And it's an issue. I want to burp and I can't gurgling noises. Uh, and they can vary from quiet and internal where the person is aware of them happening a lot, but they're not that audible. But much more commonly, they're heard a couple feet away or even across a large room in some cases. Gurgling noises, they're much louder if one opens the mouth. Um, so gurgling noises, uh, I would say, you know, 95%. So it's not 100%. It's 100% for the can't burp maybe 90, 95% for gurgling, bloating. And by that, I just mean the feeling of pressure and discomfort. And we now describe abdomen, chest, and low neck, because those are the three levels at which people, occasionally low abdomen, but mostly abdomen, epigastrium, chest, and low neck. Abdomen, virtually universal, chest, very common, and low neck, the, the least common. And flatulence, uh, now and again, people say it's not really that much of a problem, but I'm convinced those people are deflating through the night and they just don't know it because they, when you ask those people who have flatulence, well, do you, do you get the bloating? Yes. Do you protrude? They'll say yes. And I say, well, that air has to go somewhere. So they're just not, it's not troubling them uh, during the day that much, but that's the big four, can't burp, gurgling noises, bloating, and flatulence. So in this group, the above four add up to severe daily misery for most. Now, it's a spectrum. So now and again, you'll find people who have these four symptoms, but they are a little variable. They're not. Uh, so we have siblings, for example, who have not yet been treated because though they can't burp, it's not bothering them as much as, as the typical person. What is, the necess what is necessary and sufficient for the diagnosis? If, if we have a thousand people who have accurately self-diagnosed, if we have a thousand people of whom maybe 200 have had extensive tests, or maybe probably more than 200, and nobody got the diagnosis, so then what's necessary and sufficient for the diagnosis? Well, I think you need an office visit or a telemedicine kind of a thing. We do some of those, and you match the patient to the syndrome. You need an examination just to look at their jaw and what kind of trouble you might have uh, in getting the job done. And I include esophagoscopy because it's so interesting and it's so confirmatory, but I, it's debatable whether it's actually essential for the diagnosis, but it's so easy to do here in the office with a little ENT scope. Uh, what about tests? Uh, well, what have we learned from tests so far? Dr. Snelleman, he's another doctor that I uh, explained this to in Amsterdam. He and colleagues have done a study of uh, manometry in eight patients, and they were able to show the hypertension, the, the overtension of the upper esophageal sphincter. But the point is, you already know the diagnosis, and now you're doing manometry to prove what you really already know. So I think this is going to be a debate. Do people need manometry or do you say, let's go straight to the, the critical test, which is Botox. It validates and it treats. 
So lifelong versus recently acquired, it's a different scenario. If a person says, I developed this a year ago or two years ago, we have a few like that. Bona fide RCPD resolved by Botox, but it's a subset. It's a small, small, small subset. So the majority of people, it's lifelong. And again, remember that it may have come to their awareness, you know, later. And by the way, lifelong excludes infancy because two out of three did burp during infancy or we have no information. The one out of three that had trouble as infants uh, couldn't burp, a lot of spitting up, colic, um, gassiness, uh, that they that is a subset, about a third, but it is not required that they couldn't burp as infants. It's helpful if they couldn't, but and then Botox injection is a test. So in summary, the great uh, physician, Sir William Osler, the father of modern medicine said, quote, listen to your patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. And that, it seems to me, is profoundly the case for our CPD. But I am one person, I have one opinion, and other doctors will disagree with that. And that's all good. You know, there should be discussion and debate, and people should do manometry and, and so forth. But as far as individual patients, I think they could reasonably say, well, thank you very much. Uh, but I would I would you mind if we just go straight to Botox? Uh, now, uh, prior literature. When I did this first patient from several states away and began to get the inquiries through Reddit and such, uh, after I'd done them maybe 20 people and was getting great results, I thought, you know, I better look this up. I, I have an academic background. I was a professor of otolaryngology um, at some level for, for 20 years. I ended as full professor. And so I thought, you know, I better do the academic thing. And so I looked it up, and these three articles at the top were the only ones that I could find. And so they are individual case reports. They don't really define, they don't codify the disorder, and they had none of the three had any solution. I mean, they made recommendations or suggestions. None of them included Botox, and none of them had treated this patient to, to resolution. So really, the original 51 is the first description of it as a complete syndrome with a solution. Now, uh, useful additional, th this Dr. Snelleman, who I mentioned, he and colleagues did the, the manometry uh, to kind of prove the disorder that we already know exists. And Dr. Karelis here, who is the kind of kahuna of esophagology, actually happens to be at Northwestern, uh, 20 miles east of us here, has written a very nice uh, kind of overview of the esophagus, including uh, some openness, at least, to this disorder. Well, the first dis the first 51 patients, if you want to find that article, you can go to the Laryngopedia comprehensive resources in one place, if you like, or you can just type into your browser, Bastion Belch, those two words will bring this article right up. And this is the original 51, and it's uh, pretty much still the same story. I don't know that I've added a great deal to the original description. Well, what about less universal symptoms that are common? Well, there are some painful hiccups, that can be a single hiccup, such as after eating, you have this sudden big hiccup and it hurts and then you're done. Some people have a few hiccups and then now and again, people have ongoing hiccups and they are typically painful. And I think it's because everything is so full of air and stretched. Uh, organs that are stretched, muscular organs that are stretched tend to hurt. And so you have this sudden upheaval of the hiccup and uh, it hurts. Nausea after eating or throughout the day. I have a young woman who said to me, I don't know what it is to not be nauseated. I'm kind of nauseated all the time. And she incidentally told me that her gastroenterologist said, well, fine, go do this procedure if you want, but it's not going to solve your nausea. Well, she called me a week after her Botox injection and she said, doctor, for the first time in years, I'm not nauseated after I eat. It's amazing. Uh, shortness of breath. 
the idea there, it's not a cardiopulmonary shortness of breath, it's a mechanical shortness of breath. People say, I get so full and so bloated, abdomen, chest, low neck, that there's just no room. I, I, I just can't breathe. And they'll say, I couldn't dream of going for a bike ride or for a walk when I'm in that circumstance because I, I just can't fill. And uh, hypersalivation, that tends to occur in people who they've eaten, maybe eaten a little too much, they're a little nauseated, and their mouths kind of water. I don't know if any of you have been nauseated and your mouth sort of, so they hypersalivate, which of course makes them swallow more. And each time you swallow, you swallow a little bit of air. And so they, they just pump themselves up uh, with that nausea and hypersalivation. Constipation, I'm working on an understanding of that. Uh, I've had a few people say, you know, I've been constipated for years and I'm that's so much better, but it isn't everyone. So some of them uh, have said, no, their constipation has not been uh, gotten better. So I'm still working on that. The rule of thumb, in my opinion, is that if there is a strong match, I don't know if you're seeing this uh, <laughs> part of the screen, but if there is a strong match with RCPD, every GI symptom is from our CBD until proven otherwise. It isn't that you couldn't have a second GI syndrome, but my rule of thumb is if you have a strong match with our CBD, anything GI uh, is our CBD until proven otherwise. Now, I don't mean if you've been proven to have gluten intolerance, I don't mean that, but I, I'm just saying any kind of functional uh, GI thing is our CBD. Now, um, visual explanation of symptoms. Here you see a normal kind of chest X-ray and you notice the arrow that's pointing at this air bubble. Every human being has an air bubble in their stomach. It's a normal thing. Every chest X-ray looks like that. Well, people with RCPD, look at this stomach air bubble. Massive stretching and overfilling of the stomach. That is the stomach filled with air. This is the transverse colon, which is depressed. Its, its level is depressed in the abdomen by this huge, massive stomach. And then look at all the, there's random air you see everywhere in the abdomen, but really filling the transverse colon and look at it in the descending colon. The reason this is so dark is that it's a large volume of air. And uh, so that explains the bloating. It explains the flatulence, uh, nausea. How could a person not have that nausea with that kind of full stomach? It explains the abdominal distension. People actually stick out. We use pregnancy as an analogy. And very typically, it's three or four months and not at all infrequently. It's six and seven months. And I have a very, very slender young man, uh, 25 or so, who said 11 months. Uh, and uh, when I injected him on the, the operating table, it, he almost looked like he had malnutrition. He had this tremendous distension of his belly. Why can't people breathe? Well, this is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a very thin sheet of muscle. And when it contracts, it, it flattens, which has the effect of increasing lung, chest, cavity volume and decreasing abdominal volume. Well, if your diaphragm is lifted up by all of this air in the stomach, you can see that why that person would say, I just can't breathe. I can't, I can't fill. And here is abdominal crisis. I've run into, this is the main one of a person. He just did all the wrong things. Uh, very intelligent young man, but he, he, I think he had a spasm of of rebellion against this misery. Uh, and so he took a bunch of laxatives and he, he uh, the laxative unfortunately had a, a carbonation in it. It was magnesium citrate. And he just, uh, look what he did and ended up in the ER. They had to put down an NG tube. This is not really a risk for all of you watching. I don't want anyone to uh, say, could this happen to me? Really, if you don't do the wrong thing, that's not going to happen to you. Just don't do carbonation, basically. 
classic esophageal findings, I, I quite like looking in the esophagus because I'm using my little tiny uh, GI scope. I mean, my little tiny ENT scope, the caliber of the scope is, is little bigger than this and the nose is numbed and we just slip it down and people swallow this without any difficulty. But look what we see in the esophagus. This, I had a hard time getting my local GI doctors to take this seriously. Uh, I mean, I talked and talked and talked. And then finally, when I began showing them these pictures, I think that's when I first got their attention. They said, you did that in the office? Yes. What kind of scope? Just my ENT scope. You didn't blow any air in there? No. So in other words, to, to do a, a formal esophagoscopy in an average or normal person, you have to have a compressor and your scope has to have an air channel. So what you're doing is you, because the esophagus is a collapsed tube, you have to blow air in so that the walls of the esophagus get away from your scope so that you can now see the walls of the esophagus. But I don't have to do that because everybody's full of air. This is the tracheal indentation. The trachea is not compressible. The spine is not compressible. Uh, this is the aorta. And instead of the, the aorta being a, a medial bulge, you see the, the whole top surface of the aorta because the esophagus is stretched laterally over the top of the aorta. And all of that is looked at with no insufflated air, insufflated meaning blown in air. Here's another person. You see the tracheal indentation. You can't compress it. Do you see how you almost can see the, the, the curvature in the esophagus? Like it's trying, it's almost trying to stretch around the trachea. You see that right here too. This is the left main stem bronchus, I think. I need to look at my anatomy more to, to be sure of that. But and this is the aorta right here. Here you see a nice example, the trachea. The spine, this is an older person, so there's a little bit of arthritis in the spine. And look at the sort of lateral bulging of the esophagus. Um, so uh, now here's another visual. Do you see this? This is the same person. You notice the little tiny dark dot here, dark dot here. This is the very same person. There is no weight loss between these. The weight here is the same as the weight here. This is uh, morning and this is afternoon. So people inflate during the day, they deflate evening and through the night. Now this is how she looked after Botox and it's usually once and done. She has her, she says she can wear the clothing she wants to wear. Uh, people who have this problem late in the day, they say, I, I'm so limited in my wardrobe. I can't wear uh, the sort of fashionable things I want to, I just have to wear sacks all the time because I have to be able to, to expand. Uh, now, if the syndrome criteria can't burp, gurgling, bloating, flatulence, and with or without the hiccups and the, the nausea after eating and, and so forth, if you match all of those, what then? Here's my suggested clinical sequence. And again, uh, I'm one person and uh, other doctors may disagree and that's fine. I like discussion and, and disagreement and debate. That's fine with me. But my personal suggested clinical sequence is validate the syndrome and we use a questionnaire to, to help us with that. Examination with or without the ENT is just added to the simple first office visit. We just do a little swallow study that lets me look at their anatomy, assess how difficult I might think I think it might be to place the Botox and then inject the Botox. My first uh, probably 100 or so patients were with 50 units. Great results. I, I had no reason to ever change from 50. But then I did have one or two. By the time you get out long enough, you start to have a, a few who recur. And so I thought, I wonder if it's a dose issue. So I just arbitrarily increased to 75, which is my continuing initial dose. And 75 in this muscle is quite a large dose. That is not a small dose. That's a big dose. And the reason I do quite a big dose is I'm really after once and done. If I can possibly get a person burping and they just do this one time and then they're fixed for the rest of their life, that's what I want to do. And so I'd rather have a few people a little bit 
uncomfortable because they're a bit over treated with 75. I say to them, you know, I can't, I can't, I don't know what your sensitivity is to Botox. So I just want to give a dose that's going to really treat everybody. And there are the highly sensitive people are going to struggle a little bit more at the beginning with excessive burping and the swallowing issues, which I'll describe. I've also used a hundred when I do a redo. I usually concentrate the Botox in a little smaller volume so that it doesn't diffuse into other muscles. And I go to a hundred units. Uh, and especially if they didn't get full burping, that doesn't happen very often, often, but, and I think I've done one hundred or a few 125. Operating room versus EMG. I've done most people in the operating room through the mouth, uh, uh, brief general anesthesia, and I've done maybe 30 people. I, I don't know what the number is. Maybe that's too high. I, I, I'll have to ask Melissa, but quite a few I've done with the EMG. Not my preference, but there are people who prefer that method. And it works quite well almost all the time. Uh, make sure you practice once you get your burping. Uh, that's the clinical sequence. Validate the syndrome, an examination, consultation, inject the Botox, and then make sure you practice uh, to maximize the opportunity for once and done. Okay, so here's the injection. This is from the original uh, article. This is the view in the operating room. This procedure takes very little time and you see a very tiny needle. It looks huge here, but it's a 25 or 27 gauge. And this is the bulge of the muscle. And so I'm injecting here and then I usually inject over on the other side. The EMG, you have to inject from laterally like this. I think you can see um, laterally through the side of the neck. And um, you have people sniff to avoid the, the larynx muscle. It's a big story. but So the results are amazing. Now, I'm going to confuse you. These are the people who can't. So 51 of 51 couldn't burp. 50, 50, 50 of 51 had the gurgling. 49 of 51 had the uh, bloating, uh, pain and bloating, and 43 out of 51 admitted to the flatulence. And again, I think some of these people have flatulence. They just had no reference or they didn't realize how much they're deflating in the night. So uh, this is after treatment, one week, look at the difference. Why do they still gurgle? Because some of them say they gurgle and then it ends with a burp. So that's why we didn't get rid of gurgling and absolutely everybody. Usually they say they're quieter. And then the, uh, the bloating, all, uh, one person still had some and the flatulence, a few still had some, but that's a remarkable change. Now at greater than six months, we uh, we have 11 who lost the ability to burp or lost part of the ability. And this is part of the reason why I went to a higher dose, even though look how well we did at one week. I thought, well, let's really uh, treat them harder. So the first 200 patients after six months, these are the ones they can't burp. And here are the ones who can't burp after six months. So you see we're at, uh, now we're at 10%, the first 200 who, who lost the ability to burp. Yeah, I think it's more like 20% if you follow people a long time. I think it's four out of five are able to burp permanently. Um, now, what about the, sorry, I'm trying to, I want to drag this down, get it out of my way. Expected early side effects. Now, side effects are different from complications. Inopportune belching, uh, excessive belching. Uh, doctor, I've caught up for my whole life. Is there anything you can do to stop me from belching? Because I'm belching every time I swallow. I even take a very deep breath. And when I breathe out, I belch. And I say to those people, you're one of the very sensitive to the Botox. So we overtreated you. And I'm sorry, but you just have to kind of deal with this. And uh, it's all in a good cause. We're on our way to something great. But that happens in a few, not very many, where the belching is excessive. Then food hanging or slow swallowing, people describe it. If you remember, the idea of the sphincter is it's a circular muscle, it's contracted, except at the moment that saliva or food or liquid goes through and then it clamps on the backside. 
Well, once we treat with Botox, it's not going to clamp. So the, the food goes in there, liquid goes in and keeps going because of gravity. But the food has enough sort of friction that it just hangs. It's not stuck or lodged. The perception might be that because you don't know how else to describe it. It feels like it's stuck. It's not stuck. It's just hanging. And it's in the right place and it's a safe place. So you just take your liquid and you just uh, chase it. Uh, so once in a while, just a few people out of a thousand, that's a very big deal where they say, you know, I swallow my food, I chase it with liquid. And then after the swallow is finished, the food wants to push back up. And I think that's because the pillow of air is indented by the food and then the pillow of air pushes back up. And you say, well, why is there a pillow of air if you've got the Botox in there? Well, it's because the esophagus, esophagus is so stretched in some people that I'm convinced it just can't, it can't squeeze. And so we're doing primarily overflow, like, like overflow incontinence. We're overflow burping. That's the micro burps. So that always goes away, though that excessive burping and the slow swallowing is the first few weeks. It's not permanent. Um, so the uh, the outliers, we focus on the outliers so that they understand there's not something that's gone wrong. It's just that you're unusually sensitive. Now, a word about surgical anatomy, uh, normal occlusion here. This is distal occlusion. Um, you, you notice the, the retrognathism. I've got a little bit of that where my lower jaw is in from my, from my upper jaw. Uh, and so if this is quite marked and if the neck is very short, it makes the, the scope quite difficult to do. So this would be easy. This is usually easy. Most of these are even easy. But now and again, if you have a very small lower jaw, very narrow dental arch, uh, and a very short neck, it can be a little difficult. Uh, so that's why some people are a little more sore than other people. The majority basically say I'm a little sore here where the injection occurred on a 10 point scale. I think the commonest answers are three, maybe four. We give strong pain medicine to maybe one out of 50 people. Uh, most people take nothing or they take Tylenol. Once in a while, they combine Tylenol with Motrin, but I rarely write a prescription uh, because it's just not that uncomfortable. Complications, dental injury, a few. We have to put pressure on these upper central teeth. Uh, we use a tooth guard, and in some we fashion their own individual harder guard because we can see that they're going to be a little more difficult. So a few out of 100 have had a little roughened area that I just file and smooth off. Uh, dental injury, dental sensitivity. I had a patient from out of country who uh, was uh, one of these hyper-focused, um, extremely concerned, you know, and he had these little microelectric shocks. He said in this, one of his teeth, there was no damage to the tooth. It wasn't loose. It wasn't roughened, but he just said he had these little tiny micro shocks and he was just really stressed and panicked and, and it, but it of course went away. I had someone recently, a very difficult anatomy, who had uh, these lower teeth uh, were just a little sore and a little loose. And all that happens is you just st uh, stay away from eating apples and corn on the cob and they tighten up on their own. I had one cellulitis, my number one most difficult anatomy patient. Uh, I worked and worked to get the view and she, I created a little scrape, not out of negligence, but just out of the sheer work of getting the view. And she got some cellulitis, a very sore throat, and had to have some antibiotics for a few days. Uh, I said one significant laryngospasm emerging from anesthesia, another out of country patient, and no harm done. It's a complication that we see in other patients who aren't having this done. I've seen a number of laryngospasms on emerging from anesthesia across my career and we know how to manage it and it creates some excitement and everything but no harm done uh, i'm not sure that he and his mother especially would would view it like i'm viewing it because you know they don't know what it is and and anyway so but no harm done didn't stay in the hospital was was discharged to his hotel room and so forth uh, one tongue laceration, and that's really my bad. That's one where, you know, in a very difficult anatomy, 
I was I just was working so hard to get the view that I didn't see that the tongue got snagged between the teeth. Uh, again, no long term harm harm done. And I can tell you, I'm a little bit hyper about tongues after that one happened. No sutures or anything like that, but just kind of embarrassing. I'm very sorry that happened. Um, very sore tongue basically is what it amounted to. And then we've had a few patients with laryngospasm. I had a nurse from the East Coast who was quite upset that I didn't tell her that could happen. And it was because I didn't know that that was going to ever happen. I think we've had about three people. That's where the larynx clamps shut and there's a kind of a uh, sound not dangerous, but very scary. So if I'm there when the laryngospasm happens, I'm not going to get excited. I'm going to come over and encourage and pat on the back and say, it's going to be okay, just wait. But of course, the individual who's who feels like they can't breathe and their throat's closing and it lasts about a, a 20 seconds to a minute. And uh, we've had three people now with that. Uh, let me see, what else do I have down here? So nothing medically serious has happened as a result of this treatment. Uh, now, uh, let's see. Here are some result examples. Now, these are taken right out of my EMR. Here's patient number one at four years. He's in his 30s. I spoke to patient, uh, still burping, gurgling, bloating, flatulence have all diminished. He mentioned non-existent. When asked about small, medium, large improvement, he answered large. He also mentioned that the procedure has been 100% successful for me, that he feels perfectly normal. He included concluded he's very happy to be the first person to have this done and to be a part of this experience altogether. And he's elated about our success. So anyway, that's the best kind of result that we want. Here's a 20 something at nine months. I'm just giving you the, the sort of range of results. Uh, so a 20 something at nine months, still able to burp, gurgling, bloating, all are gone. Symptoms continue to be zero out of seven, large improvement, still struggles with heartburn because of course you're gonna damage your lower sphincter when you are filled with air and pushing up against it for years and years, manages okay. Uh, da, da, da. A 60 year old at four and a half months. Yes, but uh, at four and a half months, yes, but the frequency of burping has diminished greatly over the last 30 days. It was never a big gurgler, bloating. Bloating was completely gone, and I would now say it is greatly diminished. Flatulence gone or about the same, still primary way to get rid of gas. I was seeing a huge difference in my symptoms initially, swallowing it back to normal, burping less, and really have to force them out, turning my head to the side. You see that? So 60-year-olds are not as plastic as 20-year-olds but most of the 60 year olds also are once and done, just not as high a percentage of, as the, the very young people. So I'd love to get everybody done when they're young. We avoid those years and decades of misery. So how, where can I get this done? There are a lot of doctors in the know, Dr. Karagama in London and Manchester, Dr. Del Supe in Belgium, Dr. Snelleman in Amsterdam, these are people with whom I've uh, communicated directly. Marcus Hess in Hamburg, Germany, Michael Pittman, New York City, Thomas Carroll in Boston. Uh, there's a doctor in Australia, but I couldn't locate his. Uh, many doctors, I give in this same talk to the Dysphagia Research Society. There are lots and lots and lots of doctors now who have uh, come into contact with this. So how do you find someone in your location? Call larger ENT group in your area. Ask the scheduler or the triage nurse, do you have a doctor who helps people who can't burp? If there's even been one patient, the entire operation will know about it because it's novel. So even the front desk person, they'll know about this burping. It'll have gone through 20, 30 people. They'll know about it. If not, ask, do you have a laryngologist, a person who deals with swallowing disorders? That would be the person to see take the Bastion Belch article with you, go see that person and ask them, can you do this for me? Uh, if you get a lot of, well, let's do some tests. I want you to see this person. You see, doctors are, are a little bit stuck in this, what I call high fact finder mode, where they want to slice and dice and complexify. Uh, it's difficult for some doctors to do big picture sort of uh, it's what I call insight thinking rather than information thinking. So if you get a lot of that, which is I'm sure is going to happen in a lot of cases, consider asking, well, Dr. 
thank you very much. I, I appreciate your wanting to do all these tests, but would I be able to just start with the Botox injection? And if you're hitting a brick wall, I say travel, go to New York, come to Chicago, go to, to, to Seattle, go somewhere, uh, even if it means traveling a few hundred miles, you certainly have a red carpet here, uh, but you could possibly find someone closer in your area who will do this for you. So use the telephone, call the ENT groups, and I think you're going to find someone who, who knows about this and will do this for you. Interesting questions. Uh, some of these came in through the 40 questions that were submitted, so I'm going to try to go fast. Dose requirement. Uh, keep in mind, Botox has very different level of sensitivity in different people. I do 100 Botox injections per month into the larynx for a rare neurological voice disorder. And the dose requirement, we treat th those people three times a year. Unfortunately, they're not once and done because it's a neurological disorder. And the dose requirement for different people to get the very same result is extremely different. It's a 5x, five times spread for for the majority of, of spasmodic dysphonia patients. So it stands to reason that the dose requirement here is going to vary between individuals. That's why I give a very big first dose. Um, so, but, you know, everyone's still asking, what's the right dose? And the answer is, well, 50 works really well in virtually everybody, but we had a few recurrences. 75 is working extremely well in virtually everybody. We have a few recurrences, so we're doing 100. But I don't want to make the first month miserable for everybody. I, I'm willing to make it somewhat miserable, but not, you know, super miserable. So uh, work up. And this is going to be a lot of debate in the medical community because people have different points of view. There are the complexifiers and there are the simplifiers. I tend to be a simplifier. That doesn't mean you're being superficial or or shallow. It just means that you're willing to work in the big picture understanding. But medicine is absolutely replete with complexifiers. And that's good. I mean, it's it's an important uh, thing to complexify, to understand in deep, deeper detail. So I'm for the complexifiers, but you just have to understand you you who you're dealing with, your particular doctor. So the workup is going to be variable, but I would just point out we already have diagnostic criteria of, quote, unerring accuracy. It's extremely powerful syndrome. And of about 200 manometries, that would be the single most important test, in my view. If you're going to do a test prior to Botox, it would be manometry. So it, of the 200 that I have had done, meaning I didn't do them, but they were done before I met the person, none of them provided a diagnosis. We got things like slow esophageal transit. We got some lower esophageal sphincter findings, but nobody diagnosed what the real problem was. And then furthermore, if patients can diagnose themselves virtually 100% correctly, then why can't doctors? Uh, especially when it's a lifelong thing. It's not an acquired or recent thing. So that's the way I look at it. Operating room versus office. You can look at the article. Um, this is the one about EMG. Uh, it's on that Laryngopedia comprehensive resources page why the variability of swallowing effects. I think it has something to do with targeting. Uh, I think it has something to do with individual uh, uh, sensitivity to the Botox. I think it has something to do with the volume. You can mix up the d Botox in a very small volume or in a larger volume, and that would larger volume might create more diffusion to surrounding muscles up into the inferior constrictors uh, which I think would, would be where I wouldn't want it to go. Why do some recur? Is it the dose? Well, we have people who have this massive relief. They burp like champs. They say, I can do these huge burps. I have no symptoms, and yet they recur. So it doesn't seem like it's a dose issue there. Is it the placement? Same question. Are they insensitive to Botox? I would say yes, if they didn't get good full burps, maybe they didn't practice. I've had a few people say, you know, you told me to practice and I didn't do it. Is it because they have this, this esophagus that's just so stretched out of, out of shape that it can't squeeze to, to eject the air? Uh, I don't know the answer. Can we teach burping? Shaker, 
I don't understand why Shaker would help when what Shaker is doing is primarily orthopedic compartment strengthening, not so much visceral compartment. Swallowing and, and airway and voice are visceral compartment. Shaker, it seems to me, is mainly going to strengthen the orthopedic compartment of the neck. Uh, lots of people do them. A few speak um, positively about them. But I would say I've had some, I've had two or three people say, I figured it out. But they usually say things like, I worked for an hour every day for a year, and now I can burp a little bit. I can do micro burps. So it seems to me, if somebody could please figure out how do you teach someone else to burp, I would love that. Then we don't have to do Botox or, or any treatment. We just send you to the, the throat chiropractor or to the swallowing expert or whatever. But so far, uh, we haven't found that. And Botox seems to just, it's the teacher. It's the training wheels. Botox is training wheels. We go from well, Botox burps to to Martha burps or, or Botox burps to uh, Zachariah burps. You know, we, we're, we're the, the Botox burps merge into the the individual's burps. Uh, role of cricopharyngeus myotomy, I've done, I forget how many, in people who recur twice, but I'm now thinking we probably should do three times because we've had now a, a few twice and done, and I think we've had two three times and done, and it might be, th be three because there's a fellow in Florida that I did three times and I we can't raise them. So that usually means that I'm fine, leave me alone. Uh, I want to identify all the babies of the world who have this, because if we can treat people really early and the age we'd have to debate, I'm doing a seven-year-old tomorrow. Um, I've done a couple of nine-year-olds, but if you can spare babies, toddlers, uh, young people, the misery of getting to 20 or 30 before this is identified, uh, you know, and when you talk to the third of people who say they couldn't purpose babies, in that third, there are a few where it was a, an ordeal for their patient, their parents, their parents were, were uh, you know, on the ledge. And so at least we need to keep this in mind. Uh, now, summary, generalizability. Uh, this is from the first 51 patients. Other clinicians can master the syndromic features, no special training. Uh, in other words, this is available to everyone. And by the way, it's now 50 states. This very day, we added Rhode Island. We've been waiting for Rhode Island for, I think, over a year. So now we have all 50 states, and I think we're up to 13 countries. Uh, now, the question submitted. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've taken too long. I think what I might do is a second Zoom where I just will sit and and ask myself the questions and answer them. That might be the simplest way because I was committed to stopping promptly at uh, seven o'clock here. So I will answer a few. Success with 14-year-olds. Yes, lots of young teenagers two nine-year-olds and tomorrow a seven-year-old. And I, as far as I'm concerned, the earlier, the better. Uh, how to get it treated with the NHS, uh, National Health Service. You know, I have experience with this because my parents are Canadian. And so I understand how hard it is to move a, a bureaucratic system of medicine. It's very hard to, to move. There are pros and cons to every medical system. Um, you know, the American medical system is absolutely fantastic in these ways and not so fantastic in these ways. The NHS is absolutely fantastic in these ways and not so great in these ways. It's sort of a pick your poison. I am a relentless kind of person. I try to be very nice, but I think I would just be relentless and, and just keep asking the NHS. Two rounds of Botox improvement, feel the second one fading. Would I be able to get it done a third time in the future? Certainly, you can do it any number of times. There's no limit. But of course, our goal is once and done. And if not once and done, then twice and done. And if not twice and done, then three times and done. So in other words, we want this solved. We want it to free you from the medical system. We want you 
uh, living on your own without us. Uh, I would like to participate as my son suffers. Uh, how many of you treated? Well, I think I've answered that. And virtually everyone, I had a fellow from New Jersey for reasons that I still do not understand who called a week later, he was easy to do. The view was great. The dose was great. And he didn't get any results. I wonder, did they mix up the Botox wrong? I will never know what happened. Thankfully, he sort of shrugged and came all the way back from New Jersey a month later, did his second injection, perfect results and once and done. So it's possible that uh, it should, it, it's kind of rare. Some people, they don't, we don't get as full relief possibly because of the stretched esophagus, et cetera. But basically the, it's a pretty uh, straightforward and virtually everybody gets uh, relief at least for the time of the Botox and four out of five, it seems to be kind of permanent. Risks, I told you those, the teeth and so forth. It's related to acid reflux. That's from Ted. No, that's from Zhao. Uh, Yao, I don't know how you say it. Uh, it's related to acid reflux because forcing upwards against the, the sphincter here from the stomach and the abdomen is eventually going to damage the lower esophageal sphincter. And so uh, acid reflux is fairly common in this group. It's the commonest misdiagnosis for the overall problem. People have it, but it's not the main issue uh, with, with RCPD. Uh, how often do complications? I, I talked about that. It's just very few. None of them have been severe. Not that the individual people wouldn't say that they're, they're cellulitis or whatever, but uh, nothing that put people in the hospital or anything like that. Um, ah, let's see. What made me think of Botox? Well, I just did a sort of uh, inductive reasoning. It was just a reasoning process to figure out what would be the thing that would cause all of these symptoms that this first young man had. And I just came up with a hypothesis and said, uh, so it's just one of those things. I deal a lot with this sphincter for other conditions. And I think that set me up maybe to, to have the thought. Um, how to convince gastroenterologists? This is from uh, this is from someone I know from overseas, and I don't know the answer. That how do you convince doctors who are resolutely resisting the diagnosis? I say take them the articles, uh, send them to my YouTube description. I've offered to talk to doctors. I'll do a web. Uh, I'll do a Zoom with uh, doctors, but. You, you can lead a horse to water, you know, can't make them drink. Um, I think we have to stop there because I committed to uh, being prompt and finishing promptly. So um, I would love to meet you all and uh, just can't do it in this context, but send us suggestions for how we might do this differently. Uh, you know, we can do another a uh, webinar of this sort. I, I can repeat the information. I can tailor it to uh, a slightly different audience. So just let me know what you'd like me to do and um, leave your, your questions in the chat. I think we're going to leave, we're, we're going to stop the webinar, but we're going to leave the chat open, I think, for a little bit. Uh, and we'll try to, to keep track of your questions. And then maybe with these 40, I can do another session so sorry, uh, can't keep going, but uh, thank you very much for tuning in and you all have a great evening or morning, depending wherever you are and au revoir. <laughs>